great to see everyone here. Guests, members, praise team, thank you for leading us in song, in worship, especially on this special day. Those of you who have been journeying with us, we have been on this series entitled Flourish, exploring God's vision for humanity. And one of the reasons why we are in this sermon series is because we are realizing and we want to realize that our beliefs shape our behaviors. Muddy beliefs produce muddy behaviors. Beautiful beliefs produce beautiful behaviors. And today's teaching is entitled Healing from Shame. When I was studying this week, I spent a lot of time studying Genesis and turning it over, over, and over, and over again. There were some insights about healing from shame that nourished my soul. And so I count it a privilege to be able to share those, share a few things with you. Shame is a debilitating feeling. Shame is a debilitating feeling. I can't speak for all cultures, but let me just share with you a few examples. Some cultures who try to teach their children to play piano, let's just take piano playing for example. Some cultures, as a child practices piano, will say, good job on practicing piano, good job, right? Whereas in other, other cultures uh, that are part of this, I don't know what you call it, honor and shame culture, I'm reading a book called Ministering in Honor and Shame Cultures to understand the dynamics of how, how do we understand this concept of honor and shame, right? Honoring our elders, honoring, honoring people that, that we respect. Uh, in other, other cultures, when a child plays piano, uh, in this culture, you might get affirmation, hey, good job playing piano. In another culture, they might say, hey, how much have you practiced? One hour. Why haven't you done 75 minutes? In other words, what's communicated within that culture is you haven't done enough, right? And so the motivation might not be so much the you are progressing and enjoying, but, but um, yeah, sit in that shame a little bit, and perhaps that will motivate you to, to play and to to practice harder, right? It happens with grades, right? Oh, hey, what's your GPA at? 3.92? Well, what can you do to get to a 3.94? Right? So there's, no, there's not much celebration in, 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 that, in that culture. And, and so what happens is the student or the child sits in that shame thinking, man, I'm just not good enough. I haven't tried hard enough. Let me share with you an experience of shame that I experienced, I don't know, over 15 years ago or so. I stayed up really late talking to my cousins in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and I got like four hours of sleep. My sister didn't want to drive. I drove two hours back home, and then I had to drive to work. My first job was at Old Orchard Mall there in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, picture people, that was my first job. And I'm driving the car. I am so tired, but I need to get to work. And uh, while I'm driving at about 25 miles per hour, I doze off because I was so tired. And the next thing you know it, I open my eyes, boom. I hit someone in front of me, and that person hit the person in front of that person. And you know that feeling when a dog is guilty and they put their, their tail between their legs and they, put, they look down and they can't look at you? That's how I felt when I called my mom. Mom, I just got into an accident and I injured the car. Shame and guilt is a debilitating feeling. In this morning's teaching, we want to answer three questions. One, what is shame? Number two, how should we not heal from shame? Three, how can we heal from shame? So the first question is, what is shame? So before we learn about shame, though, what we need to do is to discover the place where shame does not live, okay? Where does shame not live? Where is the place where shame is absent? So I want to, I want to invite you to turn with me. We're going to be in our Bibles in Genesis uh, chapter chapter 2 and 3. If you don't have a Bible, you can pull it up on your phone or your tablet. We even have the entire passage that I'll, I'll be uh, teaching from on the bulletin in the front and the back. So we're in Genesis chapter 2. We're starting there. And we're trying to answer this first question. Where's, where is the place where shame is absent? Notice verses 23 and 24. God sees that Adam is alone and he says it's not good. He needs a helper. He, cre he creates a woman and notice what 
Genesis 2, 23 says, The man said, This is at last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then verse 24 says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The phrase hold, f- hold fast is the, 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 the word cling. It means to cling. Like, um, like, like let's say that two, two lovers haven't seen each other for three months, and they were just recently married, right? Uh, they haven't seen each other for three months. And finally, the plane lands, and the, the, the wife is waiting there at, at the gate. And clinging is when, when the, the two lovers who haven't seen, them, seen each other for three months embrace. So that's what cling means. So good to see you. All right? So that's, 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 that's the idea of holding fast, clinging, embracing. And then he uses this term, one flesh. What does one flesh mean? It means united. Okay, I'm not talking about the airlines. I'm talking about coming together. United is like two pieces of metal that are welded together. The first man and woman experience permanent and inseparable separable love. Like you cannot, you can't separate them, right? Notice what the text says in verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I mean, we know what naked means, right? The other meaning for naked, other than physical nudity, is this. To have no barrier of any kind. There is nothing between the first husband and wife. To have no barrier connotes a unique intimacy. And do you notice what's special about this intimacy? The verse says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. The man and the woman did not experience any ounce of shame. Not at all. No shame. So where is the place where shame does not live, friends? Shame does not live where love is present. Shame cannot live where love is present. Love has no shame. So where does it come from? Where does this debilitating, agonizing feeling of shame come from? Well, let's go into the story. Genesis chapter 3, the story about that man and woman, beginning with verse 1. Listen to this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he slithered his way to the woman. And the text says, he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see what the snake is doing? The snake is exaggerating God's prohibition. What was God's prohibition earlier in Genesis chapter 2? You can eat everything any from any tree except one tree, and notice what the snake does. He says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So he's exaggerating the prohibition. Keep reading verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Okay, so she is right, but she's wrong. She is right that God said, "Don't, don't eat from that, but did God ever say, don't touch it? So the snake exaggerates, which then causes Eve to exaggerate. Verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The snake snake pretends he thinks that he knows better than God. You know what his message is to, to, to the woman? His message is, disobedience will bring positive blessings. It's okay. God's God's not really like that. Look what happened in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. What, is it, what does this she say? Verse, verse 6, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. She ate. Some people think it's an apple. It was definitely not durian. Definitely not durian. It was some type of fruit, okay, a delicious fruit. That smelled good, unlike durian. I, I know I, I, have, I have a thing against durian. Okay, it just smells bad. But it was a good-smelling, delicious fruit. And she ate it. He ate it. So, friends, here is the first sin. Sin is an act of disobedience. But 
Friends, there is something behind the action. Remember what we've been saying, right? Our beliefs shape our behaviors. Beautiful beliefs, right, in my mind, bear out or produce beautiful behaviors. But wrong beliefs produce wrong behaviors. So what is the wrong belief that produced the first wrong behavior in the woman? What was the belief, not just the behavior, which usually we'll focus on, hey, you, have, you haven't be, be, been behaving well enough, shame on you. We focus on the behavior, but there is a belief behind that behavior. And what was the belief that produced this kind of behavior? It's in verse 1. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? Did God actually say? The snake lies and exaggerates about God's prohibition. And what is he trying to do? The snake is trying to paint God as an unfair and stuffy God. He says, hey, did God actually say that? That was his first four words that came out of his mouth. Did God actually say? Why is he doing that? Because he is trying to insinuate that God is not really a loving God. In other words, the snake is saying, if God was really loving, then he would not restrict you. If he really loved you, if it is true that God is love, then he wouldn't restrict you. And notice what this one author by the name of Sinclair Ferguson says in his book, The Whole Christ, about the snake's lie. I love this. He says, the lie from the snake was an assault on both God's generosity and his integrity. Neither his character nor his words were to be trusted. This, in fact, is the lie which sinners have believed ever since. The lie of the not to be trusted because he does not love me false father. Let me repeat that last line. This, in fact, is the lie which sinners have believed ever since. The lie of the not to be trusted because he does not love me false father. In other words, I cannot, we cannot trust the father because he doesn't really love me. The snake says, come on, guys. Come on, Eve. Woman, listen. God can't really be trusted because if he is really loving, he would not withhold any tree from you. And what the snake does is that he plants the wrong belief in the woman. God is not loving right? And that wrong belief sprouts a wrong behavior. I reject God. Are you following what I'm saying? So the wrong behavior was caused by a wrong belief about the character of who God was. That was the serpent's main target, not to just attack the woman, but to attack the character of God. So the behavior of sin and rejection is actually rooted in the belief that God is not loving, that's where, that's where the behavior comes from. You know, according to Barner Research, I've said this several times the last few years, uh, Barner Research Group, a Christian organization that studies uh, uh, sociological data in this country, the number one reason Generation Z, those, between, those born between 1999 and 2015, any Gen Zers here? Got any Gen Zers here? All right, I'm definitely not a Gen Zer. Um, the number one reason Gen Z reject God is this, and here's the number one barrier. They say, I cannot reconcile how a good God can allow evil and suffering. Thus, many people, they reject God because they have a dark belief about God's character. That if God was truly loving, he wouldn't allow all this evil and suffering in the world. And so the rejection of the idea of God or even Christianity or even religion is based on a false belief that the God that is behind this belief system is not light, but he's dark. Are you following what I'm saying here? Think about, now, let me get a little bit personal here, okay? Don't, please don't shout the person's name out. Think about your most recent enemy, okay? Maybe a social media enemy, family enemy, friend enemy, uh, some type of enemy. Think about your, your most recent enemy. The reason why you are allergic to him or her is because you believe that he or she wants to harm you, right? You might be right about your villain's character, and I want to be sensitive to 
to those who have been victims of pain and abuse and hurt, uh, I want to be sensitive to that because sometimes we are right that, yeah, I shouldn't be receiving this. This is not good, right? You might be right about your, the, your villain's character or you might be wrong about the villain's character. Whether or not, okay, whether we are right or wrong, the result is the same. We reject our enemy's behavior, right? Because we believe that they don't really love us. Therefore, sin is the rejection of God that is based on a misunderstanding of his character of love. Let me say that again. The reason why we reject God, the root reason, is not only because we don't want to behave better, it's because we actually have a misunderstanding of who his character, what his character is like. And the question is, what happens when we reject God? The story says here in verse 7 of chapter 2, Genesis 2, verse 7, Then the eyes of both were opened after they ate the fruit, and what happened? They knew that they were naked. They knew it. The man and woman lose their innocence. They are now aware that they are naked. The man and woman experience feelings that they have never experienced before. They were experiencing bliss in the garden with, with God. Now they're like, whoa, this feels so strange. Guilt, oof. Shame, oof. I remember, um, we have some members here, Uncle Dan, Aunt, Uncle Mar Auntie Marge. I remember uh, flag football, okay, at Andrews University. I was on the intramural team. Um, Dan, Dan Dizon Jr., okay, he was the quarterback, and I was one of the receivers playing. Last chance for us to win the game, okay, last chance. And for some reason, the defender uh, left me open, and I got a clear path in the touchdown lane, and then he threw me the football, and I, I, uh, I positioned my hands to catch that ball. I caught it, but guess what happened? It slipped through my arms. We were excited to win that game. You know that feeling of a dog when he's guilty, when the, the tail goes between the legs and looks down and can't look at his owners? Friends, that's exactly what I felt like. <laughs> I have to face Dan and face all my friends because I just dropped the winning touchdown. Friends, I was ashamed to face my team. And... That's what the first man and woman feel. They feel overwhelming guilt and shame. They have their tails wagging between their legs. What is shame? New Oxford American Dictionary says, shame is a, powerful, a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. Biblical worldview, how does the Bible define shame? It's the bitter feeling that we experience when we reject God's love and his commands. <clears throat> so, what is shame according to the Bible? Shame is this agonizing feeling that we experience when love is violated and rejected. Question number two, now that we feel this, how should we not heal from shame? Notice what Adam and Eve do, okay? Notice what the first man and woman do, okay? Just a few, mo few, few more verses here, then we'll land this plane. Notice verse seven, then, they, uh, then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they, what did they do? They sewed fig leaves, those were big leaves, right? Large leaves, they sewed them together and they made themselves loincloths or like an apron. So the man and woman, the women and women, they feel unbearable shame. They try to cover their shame with, with fig, fig leaves and loincloths. And I love what the Message Bible says. Eugene Peterson says this. He says, uh, they sewed, this is the translation, they sewed fig leaves together as a makeshift clothes for themselves. Do you know what the word makeshift means? The word makeshift means... Uh, Serving as a temporary substitute or um, sufficient for the time being, right? It's like if you, get a, if you cut your finger uh, and it's a really deep cut, it's like putting a Band-Aid, a makeshift solution for the permanent solution, which is to go to the urgent care and to get, get stitches for the deep cut in your finger. Adam and Eve have a makeshift solution. They, they decide that they are going to uh, create makeshift clothes, temporary clothes, to, uh, only to serve as a, what we call a, a temporary coping mechanism, right? They want to cope through this because they're like, I've never experienced guilt and shame before, so let's create, let's create a temporary solution to kind of ease our consciences, okay? 
So how do, they, how do they cope with shame? What is this temporary solution? It's avoidance. This is how they cope with the shame. They avoid. Look at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I mean, to, to even think that they could hide, you know, behind the, behind the bushes, like, like that God wouldn't know that they're there. What was, what was Adam and Eve trying to do? They were trying to run from God. And friends, the reality is that when we experience guilt and shame, the best thing to do is not to run from God and to run from help, but rather the best thing to do is to run to God and get help. And so my encouragement to us would be, don't avoid help. Don't run and, and run away from help. Embrace the help. Okay, embrace it. And you know, I've shared this before, but one of the best decisions that I made last year was to get counseling for myself as I w- learn how to work through issues. I know that in some cultures, there's a stigma of, oh, you know, you go to a psychiatrist or a counselor or a therapist, you're a wacko. It's not true. I think I'm of a sound mind, at least when I look in the mirror, I think so. But I, I found, when I found someone who was a, a believer, a Christian counselor to, to work through some through some items, it was helpful for me. Don't run from it. Run to it. Run to the help. Here's the second thing that they did. Look what Adam and Eve do. Verse 9, but the Lord God called them to the man and said, where are you? Verse 10, he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 12, don't miss this. The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Do you see what he's doing? He feels the shame. God comes close, and instead of taking responsibility up front, he says, the woman you gave me. So one, he's, he's shifting blame and placing it on the woman, and not only that, he has the audacity to blame it on God because, God, you're the one who put the woman in my path. So he is avoiding responsibility, And look what Eve does. She's a little bit better, but it's still the same. Then the Lord God said to the woman in verse 13, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. Yeah, it was someone else's fault, and I ate. Yeah, I ate, but God, up front, just know it was someone else's fault that caused caused me to do this. The man and the woman accept blame, but the first thing they do is shift blame to other people. Friends, When we experience shame, and even if we are culpable and guilty, the faster that we accept responsibility, the faster our healing. So question two, how should we not heal from shame? Don't merely cope with shame and avoid help and responsibility. Last question, how can we heal from shame? How can we heal from it? God lists a few curses, one curse to the serpent, one curse for the woman, one curse from the man, and one of the most hopeful passages in all of Scripture are these last two verses. Verse 20 of chapter 3 says this, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. God said you're going to be fruitful and multiply. They sinned. They felt ashamed. And what happens? Adam believes the promise that even though we have messed up, I'm going to change your name to Eve, and we're going to still fulfill that promise. What's the lesson in there? That even though we've messed up and we feel ashamed for the things that we have done, if we believe God and His promises, He can cover our shame and give us hope for tomorrow. But here's the last verse before we close. Verse 21 says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. I love what Victor Hamilton says in his commentary on Genesis. This verse serves as the contrast between verse 7, the covering of fig leaves, versus the covering with tunics of animal skins. The first is an attempt to cover oneself. The second is accepting a covering from another. The first is man-made. The second is God-made. Adam and Eve are in need of a salvation that comes from not inside themselves, but from without. God needs to be, do for them what they are unable to do from themselves. What's the point? True healing from the shame that you and I experience does not come solely from within. True healing comes from without. There is a place, on one hand, there is a place for support and therapy and counseling. There are strengths in modern therapy today because it helps me understand myself 
And it also helps me to know that there's someone on my side who's willing to listen. I have a counselor. But a few weaknesses of modern therapy and counseling today is this. One, I don't really understand the depths of myself. I start to learn more about myself, and I'm like, man, that's a little bit darker than I thought I was. And where did that darkness come from, right? So one weakness is that I really don't understand. I'm actually worse off than I think I am. But the second problem and one weakness is that I'm not always going to have a counselor with me. An outside source helps. And so, friends, to only sow fig trees, fig leaves, and cope with shame is a temporary fix. But to receive outside intervention provides a more permanent antidote to our shame. And so here's the last question. How was God going to heal us? You know, like Adam and Eve, we try to cover our shame with temporary clothing. What does God do to solve this problem? The text says that he clothed them. And the question is, what did God clothe them with? A few thousand years later, there was someone who was prophesied to come. And Isaiah 53 talks about this suffering servant. He was known as the Messiah. And the text says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, with his trauma, with his shame, we are healed. Jesus experienced the infinite pain of shame so that we can be healed. And please follow the history of Jesus. Jesus, when he's here on this earth about 2,000 years ago, he quotes Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, and he, he quotes this in, the, in, in Luke, and he says, and this is how he starts his mission, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sacrifice myself and bring healing to those who experience shame in this world. Jesus fulfills his mission. Jesus is crucified. And friends, question for you, what was Jesus wearing when he was crucified on the cross of Calvary? Criminals who died by crucifixion were naked to humiliate them, which means that Jesus lost his garments. And why would Jesus lose his garments? Because in the same chapter that he quoted in Isaiah 61, verse 10 says this about the Messiah's plan. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation, which means that Jesus lost his garments so that he could cover you with the garments of his salvation. Jesus took the shame that you and I experience so that we could be covered by his unconditional love. And so how do we heal from shame? We don't only cope from within. We receive from without. We take the robes of his garments, which allows us to know that we are loved and cared for even as we are experiencing the guilt and the shame of our brokenness. And friends, out of all worldviews and all belief systems in this world, where are you going to find a, a belief system that says that through faith in the Messiah, you can be fully accepted right now, even as you are going through stuff? Where are you going to find that? Because usually we go through this darkness in life, Okay, we experience this, and we think, well, it's, uh, until I get rid of this, this darkness in my life, then I'm going to be accepted by God and the people. But Christianity says, right now, through faith in Christ and what he's done for you, you can have full acceptance without shame, even as you're dealing with the shame that you're going through. And that's what Jesus has to offer. I'm going to invite Pastor Rodney up. I'm going to participate in our, uh, our communion service, Okay. As we remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary, the good news is that we don't have to live in the shame because Jesus took the shame upon himself to give us the freedom of his healing and his truth and his life.